Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar with the Webinar Vet. My name is Bruce Stevenson, and I have the privilege of chairing tonight's session, which I promise you is going to be an absolutely fascinating one. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. For those of you that are new to webinars, if you want to ask a question to of our presenter, she has agreed to answer those at the end, but all you need to do is hover your mouse over the screen. A little bar comes up, and there's a Q&A box in there. Simply click on that. Type in your question, it'll come through to me. We'll hold all of those over to the end, and then uh, hopefully we'll have enough time to get through uh, as many questions as what we can. I don't promise all of them, but as many as what we possibly can. So tonight we are very, very privileged to have Vicki Hall with us. Vicki is a registered veterinary nurse and a full member of the Association of Pet Behaviour Behavior Counselors specializing in cats. Vicky writes and tutors cat behavioral courses, lectures all over the world to veterinary audiences. She is also a qualified person-centered counselor and registered member of the British Association of Counselors and Psychotherapists. Vicky is the author of six best-selling books for general public and also co-author of a number of veterinary textbooks and papers. So who better to talk to us about multi-cat households? Vicky, welcome to the webinar, Vet, and over to you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. I hope you're sitting comfortably. Um, I'm guessing some of you have multi-cat households or are thinking of getting a multi-cat household or whatever. So um, that's what we're going to talk about this evening, how to help cats live harmoniously together. So here we go. So are multi-cat households good or bad? Well, I'm not really going to uh, judge them one way or the other. Uh, they can be very complicated, but in order to actually establish how to have a really good multi-cat household, uh, we need to sort of go back to basics and say, right, like any decision, it needs to be an informed one. So what do we really know about cats? It is so easy, is it not, when you live with them, because they're part of the family, that they become almost like small people, and we tend to think that really they think the way we do they have the same feelings that we do and as we look at them and they look at us we kind of imagine these conversations but sometimes you know if we've got to do the right thing by them we have to step back and say right actually what do I know about the species so here we are um, unlike us um, unlike dogs cats have no biological need to be social to survive a lot of their normal behaviour is solitary. They feed alone, they hunt alone, they go to the toilet alone and they sleep alone. But the capacity to be social is something that's occurred really over thousands of years in their relationship with us. And the more they, time they spend with us, the more tolerant they become of uh, their own species. Now, just to throw something into the equation, we're not going to go too far down this route, but there, there's a school of thought that says, yes, cats are evolving, they're becoming a social species, but I wonder whether that's what actually is happening. It seems rather unlikely if they're not biologically social. It, in my view, they're actually just becoming more tolerant, more tolerant of each other, and dare I say it, more tolerant of us. And don't shoot me, but you know, sometimes when I see cats that are really, really sociable and they're all over you, um, actually, they need us rather than want us. They are so, in, in order to, to make them sociable from a self-reliant species, we actually sort of lose some of the self-reliance, so they make them need us rather than want us. So there's a fine line between getting a very friendly cat and a very needy cat, and we'll sort of revisit that briefly that particular point uh, later on. So what else do we know about cats? And those, what about those cats that don't live as pets? And certainly cats do occasionally live in groups, but they congregate around a food source. And I'm sure when you've been on holiday, you've seen uh, a group of cats hanging around the back of your hotel or whatever. And these are usually females and they're related females usually, and they, they breed and they cooperatively rear their young um, but if that food wasn't there they wouldn't be living in that group and even in that little group if a, a newcomer comes along and says 
I want a bit of this action, they'll resist that new cat coming in because they don't know them. And when you look at the way cats communicate with each other, they communicate via scent. They leave a message and then they walk away and then another cat reads that message long after they're gone. And a lot of their communication is about maintaining that distance or even increasing that distance between each other, unless of course they're, um, they're mating. And when you look at their social signaling between each other, a lot of the, the facial expressions and the postures are all about resolving conflict. There's very little sort of reconciliation behavior and appeasing behavior that you would see in um, dogs, for example, or even in us. So this just really paints them as a very different species to us, even though, as I say, they, they become these sort of little token people when they live with us in the family. They really are very, very different. So I'm going to make a few sweeping generalized statements here, and I think it's safe to say these. Some cats do choose to have social contact with other cats, and I'm sure you're all, you, you may have uh, cats, your own cats, you feel that that's very much the case. But many will avoid contact with other cats if they're given the choice. All cats are capable of living alone. They are self-reliant. They can do it. And most cats adapt really well to a solitary existence. But having said that, many of you have multi-cat households. I've had a multi-cat household uh, in the past. So how do you keep that ha household harmonious? What increases the risk of you having conflict in that household? Well, uh, one risk factor would be if you selected family members, which is good so far, but they weren't compatible for some reason. Maybe their personalities, uh, their temperaments, um, didn't quite um, join with each other and they weren't compatible in this, that sense, one very bold, maybe one very shy or whatever. Maybe you went along to view a litter of kittens and you thought, well, how can I pick two from here? So you took four kittens and the mother or whatever. Maybe your multi-cat household is one of those households that, that is acquired over time as cats turn up on your doorstep or whatever a family member can't keep a cat anymore so they come and join the family so those cats that are not brought up together then you increase the risk of having conflict what if you've got a nice stable pair nice couple of cats or three cats that's working and then you think and this is a very dangerous thought to have but ah what's one more it's only another mouth to feed, that'll be fine. So adding to really harmonious established group can cause problems. Many owners get themselves in a very sticky situation when a little stray tomcat comes into their garden or suite and they think, oh my goodness, poor soul is starving, put a little bowl of food out for him and one way or another he joins the family group. It's easily done and that can cause disruption. Having a, a lots and lots of cats in the area can actually cause a lot of social pressure on your cats, which could create some tension between them. Having insufficient resources in the home, and we'll come back to that idea of what resources actually are, but basically, in a nutshell, it's just anything your cat needs to survive and to thrive and be very healthy and happy. Keeping cats indoors either all the time or giving them a little bit of restricted access outside can increase the risk of having conflict because they're not able to choose to put a greater distance between each other. So if any of you are sort of panicking, thinking, oh my goodness, maybe my multi-cat household is not as harmonious as I thought, let's just do a little checklist. What are the good signs? What should you see to make you feel that your multi-cat household is doing okay? Well, if your cats sleep together, all curled up, touching each other. If they groom each other, there's that mutual grooming that occurs around uh, the head and around the neck. If they rub against each other as they pass each other on the, uh, in the hallway, if they play together. If when they meet each other, they chirrup and their tail goes up and they do a little nose bump, they're all good signs. It's probably all going really, really well. Bad signs. This is not such good news. What if your cats are actually fighting? 
And this isn't play fighting, this is really serious, I mean it fighting. What about hissing or growling at each other or even just staring at each other in a very sinister sort of wide-eyed unblinking way? What about if one claims a resting place over another? Let me let me explain that. Let's say, for example, one of your cats is sitting on your lap and you're having a great time and it's going really well. And then your other cat comes into the room and walks very sort of nonchalantly but purposely towards you and slowly but surely gets up onto your lap and then firmly sits on the face of the other cat until such time as the other cat says that this really isn't comfortable now and they leave. And then the second cat comes and sort of makes himself comfortable. That's a really specific act of, I'm sorry, I want what you've got and I'm going to take it. What about blocking this, this psychological warfare that cats indulge in, blocking entry and exit points? Have a look at this photograph. There's a photograph of a very casual looking ginger cat indoors and a little British shorter outside looking through the window. And that was sent to me by a client of mine who said, oh, at last, my two cats are getting on really well. Look how close they are together and they're not fighting. And I had to very sort of kindly get back to her and say, actually, I'm not sure that's such a good sign at all because your poor little British short hair can't come in. Tray guarding as well, litter tray guarding. This is quite a common thing to actually intimidate another cat to prevent them from being able to go to the toilet. And that's not your cat standing in front of your litter tray. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is your cat positioning themselves somewhere on the thoroughfare between your other cat and the litter tray. So it could be in the hallway, in the bottom of the stairs, at the top of the stairs or whatever. You have to sort of understand what you're looking for and then suddenly um, you start seeing, seeing these things more often. A lot of you will say, well, my, my cats, when they were kittens, they were lovely and they're always curled up together. And then you may notice as they get a bit older, um, you don't see that so often. And what happens is there's a definite shift in the relationship when cats become socially mature. And that can be at any time, really, depending on the individual between about sort of one and a half and, and, and four at the sort of top end. Average around about two, I guess. And what happens is as they become socially mature, they become very sort of territorially sensitive. Um, and they quite often just become separate social entities. And you don't really notice anything. They don't necessarily fight. Um, you just don't see them uh, with each other anymore. They do their own thing. They become very separate. Unfortunately, some may fight. Others, if you're very lucky, may form a lovely bonded pair or a group um, and things will rumble along perfectly well. Or one member of your group may just for whatever reason have victim written all over their forehead and all the other uh, cats will pick on them. And it's something about their body language that just means that's, um, that's the way it is. So there's all sorts of options, but certainly you will notice a shift as your cats mature. And if you've got various ages in your multi-cat group, you may notice tension as that the various members mature. So what about your multi-cat group? Why don't you, after this session, take a piece of paper, write the names of your cats around in a circle, and then start thinking about those good signs and bad signs, and think about when you have observed that happening. And then maybe sort of draw an arrow in the direction of, uh, of um, who's behaved in, in that way towards another cat. So the direction of the behavior. So uh, in this example, if Sooty grooms Tigger and Tigger also grooms Sooty and they greet each other, it's all rather lovely, um, but Smokey doesn't like Sooty or Tigger, so there's lots of aggressive behavior towards them. So this example, um, if you have a look, um, it's quite easy to see that there's a lot of nice mutual stuff going on between Smokey and Toby. So it's entirely possible they're a nice little bonded pair. And you could say the same about um, Tigger and Sooty. But Smokey is not keen on the other pair. But look at Felix. Felix is an interesting one. Felix is a bit of a, uh, a free spirit. He rather likes Sooty. Tigger rather likes him. And so does Toby. So... Probably what's happening in this five cat household, and I'm only guessing, is the fact that Felix sort of provides some sort of cohesive glue for all five of them. 
because he's he's spreading the scent of the two pairs and, and creating this lovely sort of communal scent. So that's an interesting one. But I mean, try the exercise. You, you may have a, um, a large number of cats, in which case it becomes more complicated. You may just have two. But it's worth sort of thinking to yourself, do I have separate social groups here or, or do I have one cohesive group? So let's have a look at the subtle signs of conflict because quite often it really isn't apparent and you might muddle along through life thinking, yeah, I think everything's okay. So every now and again, it's worth just checking out to making sure, uh, to make sure things really are okay. So here are just a few signs. Um, you may notice a particular piece of furniture or um, a, a bit of carpet in a thoroughfare or in, in, near an entry point might have excessive claw scratching on it where there's one cat is really sort of going crazy. Or you may notice that one cat is really doing a lot of facial rubbing against furniture and doorways. And again, it seems quite excessive. So these are two forms of, of marking this scent communication. And it could be there's uh, uh, one of your cats or more trying very hard to make sure that they avoid other cats. You may notice one of your cats seems very lazy, always sleeping. My goodness, he spends his whole time asleep. And a lot of cats fake sleep. And you can spot this if you know what to look for. They kind of look like they're asleep, but their ears aren't quite relaxed enough. They're slightly twisted towards where the sound is. And sometimes their eyes look a little bit pressed tight shut. And you think, hmm, I think you're faking it. But for a cat to fake sleep, it actually sort of takes them out of the social conflict. I'm just going to sit here with my eyes closed and hopefully nobody will bother me. You may notice some of your cats hide or one of your cats hides. Or maybe they become a bit more clingy and dependent on you or suddenly they just withdraw from you, don't want anything to do with you anymore. You may even find that they get aggressive towards you which is sort of like a, a redirected thing because they're so aroused and aware of the threat from the other cat that they actually might just take it out on you. Well, you may get your cat giving you these really conflicted signals. They give you all the sort of loving signals and somebody suddenly they might hiss or, or, or lash out at you because they're always alert, always looking for danger. You may notice a little subtle, subtle bit of uh, body language where they, the tongue, in, as you can see in this picture, just comes up briefly to the nose and goes back in again. Or a little bit of exaggerated swallowing every now and again. Or you might be playing and then the other cat comes in the room and the cat that was playing stops uh, and just looks slightly edgy. And unfortunately, there are some not very subtle signs of conflict. And you may actually find that you are experiencing what would be considered one of the problem behaviours that you would um, take to your vet to, to speak to them about. Urine marking, where the cat uh, deposits a small amount of urine on a vertical surface, a little mark. Again, this, this form of communication to maintain distance. Or constant overt aggression, which you just cannot control and cannot manage. Or a cat may be urinating or defecating outside the litter box in the, in the house. Or even one of your cats may become unwell. And you realise once your, your vet uh, checks them over, they've actually developed a stress-related physical condition, maybe of the bladder, the bowel or the skin or whatever. So you can see that conflict can have an impact on cats physically as the chronic stress actually impacts on their well-being. So don't despair, even if you have a sense that there is a little bit of something going on um, that you think needs fixing. I just want to share with you some of these little hints and tips for you to successfully manage uh, a multi-cat household. I think be realistic when you think about this. If your cats are avoiding each other and you'd love to see them playing together, but they just don't, I think just accept that as okay. Oh, that's perfectly normal. And if you get a household where all the cats do their own thing um, and they're perfectly happy, then I think that's a good thing to aim for. Now, in my view, the key to success is threefold. The cats need to be compatible. There need to be lots of resources that they can access 24 seven. 
And the third thing, a bit sort of left field, you, you need to, to accept the fact that if there's a very dense population of cats outside, that's going to put additional pressure on yours. So let's just have a look at compatibility to start with. And um, we know that most people say, oh, get siblings, don't have strangers. And I've sort of alluded to that already. You have um, unrelated um, stranger cats together, it's higher risk of conflict. But unfortunately, even with siblings, we cannot guarantee that as adults in your particular environment or any particular environment, that they're still going to be compatible. There is no reliable predictive test for compatibility, unfortunately. There's lots of personal anecdotal sort of theories and opinions, you know, mix the genders or have two girls or don't have two boys or um, don't mix breeds or this breed gets on well with other cats or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's a bit of a lottery. Certainly, introducing a kitten to an existing adult cat is easier from a territorial perspective because it's, it's less of a territorial challenge. But on the other side, kittens come with their own issues and kittens are boisterous and they have um, not very good social skills and they're likely to blunder up to uh, an unknown adult cat and just start um, biting them and playing with them and things. So you might not have the territorial stress of, of an adult invader, but you've got the annoyance um, and ultimately potential stress from a kitten that won't leave you alone. So it's very difficult. Some people will say, um, no, have an adult cat, but get an adult cat with a proven history of positive multi-cat living. But even that, I mean, if you're talking about going for a pre-owned cat from a rehoming centre, you've got to ask yourself, if things were so fine in the previous home, unless all the cats from that home have come into the centre because of, um, of the owner's circumstances, one has to ask why the cat is in there. And even if you do have a proven history of a positive multi-cat existence before, that was in that environment with those cats. It doesn't follow that the next one will be as harmonious. Certainly a cat with a calm temperament, one that isn't highly reactive, uh, may be of benefit, but it, it is. There is no question. Some people succeed despite the odds and some people really do everything they can to limit uh, the possibility of it going wrong and, and unfortunately it goes wrong. And of course, even if the kitten is successfully introduced, relationships change with time as the kitten matures. So if you're joining this uh, webinar and listening, thinking, well, I'm here because uh, my little cat is, is lonely and I, I'm thinking of getting another one, thereby entering into the world of multi-care households. Um, I just want you to sort of really think about this. And, and a lot of people say to me, I want a companion for my cat because I'm out at work all day and my cat is lonely. And for those of you who think that way, I just want to reassure you that um, because they are the very special kind of species they are and they are self-reliant, um, I don't think I've ever met a cat that has been lonely in the sense that we would understand it. And if you're still convinced the cat's lonely, then I would say, what are you seeing to make you believe your cat is lonely? And it could be that the behaviour that you're seeing um, is something that could be interpreted in a very different way. I would also ask you, how old is your resident cat? Because if your resident cat is a kitten, then your kitten may well want the uh, uh, company of another kitten. But as I say, relationships change uh, with age. And if your cat is 15 and maybe just lost uh, a sibling kitten at this stage of your life when what you want is routine and predictability. So there's lots of things to think about um, if you're embarking on a multi cat household for that reason. Just on the um, subject of this, um, back in 1995, which, which does seem like a long time ago, um, I conducted a really interesting survey, owner survey, and they had to complete a questionnaire about how their cat's behaviour had changed as they had grown older. Um, and um, one of the questions was, if your cat shared a home with another cat and that other cat died, how did your cat respond? And actually the majority of owners reported their cat was completely unaffected which feels quite odd for us because it's such a traumatic experience for us. It's rather 
but it's rather strange to imagine our cats just say whatever. Um, but 50 people wrote quite extensively about the negative reaction their cats had, and 55 wrote quite extensively about this uh, positive reaction. The cats were, were uh, absolutely joyous um, at the demise of the other one. Um, so we won't sort of look at that necessarily, but let's look at these negative uh, reactions. And the interesting thing was, going back to what I was saying earlier about are these cats really highly sociable or are they actually needy? I think with one exception, the negative reactions came from the Siamese and the Burmese. Those cats who, who are so uh, affectionate with their siblings and so affectionate with owners that have these codependent personality types. These are the cats that if uh, an owner passes away or, or their sibling passes away, they become physically ill and actually quite often need veterinary intervention uh, to get them eating and to, to get them to remain alive because they go into such a decline. So I thought that was really interesting um, that their response to the death of a sibling was more like a, a sort of cold turkey uh, response to that sort of addictive relationship. So not to put too much of a downer on it, I mean if you do introduce another cat to your existing cat and a compatible cat is chosen, um, with a little bit of luck and, and a certain amount of planning and the introduction process is appropriate um, and you have sufficient resources. There's lots of ifs and buts, but um, there's every chance it will be okay. And talking about introductions, I just want to give you a quick whiz through the introduction of a kitten, just in case any of you are planning this. Um, and this is probably, there's all sorts of different advice about this, but I, I find this probably to be the most successful, most gentle and, and diplomatic way to introduce a kitten into an existing adult cat. Obviously, you want to make sure they're both vaccinated and health checked uh, before, before you introduce them. And we're going to go on the basis that you introduce them by scent to start with, because that's how it happened in the, in the real world for them. Then they can see each other and then uh, the chance of physical contact. So the first thing you would need to do is create uh, uh, a room for the kitten and this would be a room that your existing cat doesn't spend much time in so that you're not immediately going to put their nose out of joint by taking away a favourite place. Safety check the room or the normal advice for kittens, you don't want anything dangerous in there that might harm them and then put all their stuff in there, put all their resources, their food, their water etc, litter tray, toys, all into this room and within the room also include what I would call a, a kitten pen. And there's a few examples uh, in the pictures. Um, the top one probably is the most um, recognised type. There is another type with a little shelf in it. So you can see the white one, probably for the purposes of this exercise, um, although I like them a lot because they're very flexible, I would avoid the fabric one because you don't want the resident cat jumping on the top and collapsing the whole thing. And then once the kitten is established, the first thing you do is swap some bedding and some familiar objects. So you take the stuff from the kitten and put it uh, into an area where a resident cat can take their own time uh, to actually explore the smell and vice versa, some of the stuff and put it in from your resident cat and put it in with the kitten. Don't feel you need to overcompensate with your existing cat when a new kitten uh, comes on the scene. Give your cat exactly what um social contact and affection that they normally enjoy if you overdo it it actually is going to become quite uh, unpleasant for them and that's not going to be a positive thing keep the routines as normal as possible you really want to signal to them nothing's changing it's just a kitten you're not going to miss out on anything when you're ready to introduce them you want to give the kitten a few days to settle in. You want to make sure the pen's in a corner of the room because you don't want your resident cat circling the kitten, intimidating the kitten. And put a box in the kitten pen um, for shelter in case the kitten feels a bit scared. Why this resident cat? Put a blanket over the top so that your cat can't jump on top. Uh, give the kitten a toy or some treats to, to distract them. Um, and open the door to the room whilst closing the door to the kitten pen and just just see what happens. Um, let the rest of the cat explore. And then if they're, they, they're nice and passive and, and gentle, benign behavior or positive behavior, give it a little bit of praise and a nice high value food treat just to say, you know, good job. 
over a period of time you want to move that kitten pen to other rooms in the house so that the resident cat can sort of encounter this new um, little furry thing in various places and then after a few weeks open up the pen and allow some physical contact to take place. Um, this process can happen very very quickly in my experience or it can take um, several weeks but it's worth putting in the effort if there's any tension. Certainly I would recommend just while we're talking about kittens for a moment to maintain that kitten room just to reinforce the litter training so shut the kitten in there at night so the kitten gets used to um, that's where the toilet is and, and so on and so forth it's good to consolidate litter training at this age um, and probably keep the kitten separate when unsupervised if there's any concerns until they're sort of big enough to um, to, to get away should they be chased or anything Okay, what was the second one, the key to success? And that was availability and accessibility of resources. And this is something you can have fun with at home. You can just do this um, uh, in, entirely on your own because all the instructions are available for you. Now, you can go on the internet and in your search engine, you can type in feline environmental needs guidelines. And up will come uh, a, a wonderful published paper um, from the American Association of Feline Practitioners and the International Society of Feline Medicine. And it's a wonderful thing that says, you know, forget the environmental enrichments, all well and dandy, but really these are the needs that you have to provide for your cat in order for them to have a good home. And it's a really good um, basic guideline for you with your multiple cats. And uh, they call them the five pillars because there are five things that you have to have in place. It's a safe place, lots of uh, resources, lots of opportunity to, to play, good, positive, consistent interaction with humans and an environment that respects the importance of the cat's sense of smell. And remember, right at the very beginning, we talked about um, the sense of smell being so important to cats because that's how they pick up information about each other. Um, by scent. Okay, so let's look at each one of these uh, one at a time. Provide a safe place. Now this is where um, your cats will retreat on their own uh, when they're scared. They, it could, or when they need time out from each other. And this needs to be uh, secure in their opinion and private. So we mustn't go fussing it or cleaning it or changing bedding too frequently or going to find them when they're there and we haven't seen them for a while. This must be sacrosanct. It must be somewhere where they feel they can go to escape whatever's happening. It could be in a raised location. They may like to look down at proceedings uh, so they can see what's going on but not actually be involved. Um, or they may just prefer to go somewhere quiet, like inside a wardrobe or under a bed. And this place may feel so secure for them, they may take themselves off there to sleep as well at different times. All your cats, no matter whether you've got one, two or seven or eight or whatever, need to have these secure places um, where they can go. So you need to have plenty of um, secret sort of hiding areas where your cats can go. Um, and then it's up to them to choose which ones they want. Now number two is to provide multiple and separated key environmental resources. We spoke about resources before so let's name them. They would be places to eat, uh, places where you can get water, places where you go to the toilet, where you scratch to mark, where you rest or sleep, where you play and also where you hide and where you go up high to observe but not be observed. So you can add those two in as well. All of your cats need a set of these and I use a formula which I've used um, for a long time in my career which is this wonderful formula of one per cat plus one extra in different locations. Um, always was my fixed formula for litter trays but over the years it's morphed into my fixed formula for resources in general. Why, why scrimp? Having that one extra just means that there always feels like a slight surplus, even though it's, it, it's, you know, you're not giving them more food, you've just got more places to obtain food. So it just gives that sense that no matter what, if one's blocking one, you can always get another. It's just a formula that seems to work. Certainly giving the cats the opportunity to feed separately. 
if you've always fed your cats together, as is the case with, with most people, because eating for us is a social event, um, cats are solitary feeders, but they make themselves um, feed for side by side because that's the way it is. Um, if that's what you've already uh, always done, don't suddenly start separating the food because that can freak some cats out. Always, if you're, if you're adding more resources, don't take any of the existing resources away. Add more in. That way, nothing really changes. It just gets better. They don't lose anything. They just get more. And the same applies if you're adding um, more litter trays or adding bigger litter trays or whatever. Always leave the existing ones until the cats don't want anything more to do with them. And located in such a way, and this is so important for multi-cat households, that all cats have access to at least one of each without risking being blocked by another cat. So positioning really is everything. I swear to you, I would never play a game of chess with, with a cat because they're so good at strategy. They're so good at thinking ahead and planning. Or they appear to be. And it might be easier for you just to do a rough floor plan of your home and experiment on paper as to where you can put these things and then work out where each cat might be in the house in relationship to each other and whether um, both of them have access to a full set of resources without having to bump into each other. So it's quite a fun exercise to do. And you may find, for example, oh my goodness, everything I've got is downstairs. So if Sooty's upstairs and Ginger's on the stairs, poor Sooty. Um, so for example, if you've got more than one floor to your property, if you've two stories, for example, you make sure you have a full set um, at least upstairs and downstairs. So you can have some fun with this. So maybe this is something um, you'd like to have an experiment with. So number three of these five pillars was provide opportunity for play and predatory behaviour. And this could be sort of getting food in novel ways. As you can see, there's some cats playing with toilet rolls and, um, well, cat mangas playing with a, um, a cat feeder in the top right hand corner. Interactive play that you can play with them or object play or actually them playing with each other. There will be occasions when certain cats will not play with others. So you want to make sure that you give each cat time to play and respect the fact that some don't want to play in front of other cats. That's just a, um, a point. Otherwise, some cats will never really play because there'll always be other cats around. So make sure you set time out for those cats. Just have a little private one-to-one uh, -one session. With regard to social play, where cats play with each other, you may have noticed that if two of your cats start to play fight, it might escalate into something that actually turns into uh, they get overexcited. It turns into a proper fight. So you can see there's two cats at the bottom of the screen there playing uh, with their heads inside one of these cat tunnels it's a really good idea to have lots of things dotted about like um, uh, tunnels like this or cardboard boxes or whatever so that cats do not have wide open spaces to play in because that's when it can get quite heated if they've got things to play around um, it tends to stop things from from escalating so that might be something you want to um, think about for your cats and number four is our responsibility uh, to provide positive, consistent and predictable interaction with our cats. And what we've got to bear in mind is no two cats, I don't know whether you've noticed, are, no, are the same. Uh, every single cat is different and they vary in their level of sociability, what they want from us, uh, what they don't want from us. And it all depends on their breeding and their early experiences. Generally speaking, and I, I, I'm not going to say all cats are the same but generally speaking cats prefer interaction to be quite sort of brief quite a, a lot of them but really low intensity just sort of very low key and a really really important thing is cats should be able to control social contact so many people who see that there's a, a lack of fairness when one of their cats monopolizes their attention the other one seems to hold back and they, they always feel, well, that's, that's okay. I'll go and give the cat attention to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm loving them equally. Sometimes that creates more problems than it resolves. And it's better to say, if this is what you have to do in order to get by, um, I will make sure that if you seem receptive and you're up for it, that, that we'll have some time together. 
but I'm, I'm cautioning people to be very careful not to actually um, initiate the contact when the other cat is pers purposely uh, hanging back from you. And you know the signs that cat is receptive. They'll come to you. They'll do that nice little gentle friendly purr. They might cheer up. They'll rub their face or or um, headbutt you. And the little tail will be up in the air or they might sort of flop in front of you. Do bear in mind, if they do that little relaxed roll that you can see that ginger cat doing on the um, paving stones there, don't dive in to give them a tickle on their tummy. Uh, I'm pretty sure you probably know that already because if you've tried that, um, the cat will think there's some sort of assault and they'll start grabbing and biting you. So some cats tolerate it, but I wouldn't go up to a strange cat and do that. And number five is this providing an environment that respects the importance of the cat's sense of smell. So if you imagine their sense of smell is so much more acute than ours and they need to understand the scent, they need to pick up information about their environment from the scent. The last thing they want is for it to be um, overridden by some strong smelling um, products that we might have in the house, like really strong smelling candles or, or perfumes or whatever. And sometimes just bringing smells in from outside on our shoes can make things worse for them. So um, it's sometimes an idea just to make sure your outdoor footwear stays at the front door and any new items brought into the house can be introduced with care. Um, lots of scratching areas. It's really important that cats are able to provide this uh, scratch mark in, in various places. So lots of places where it's safe for them to scratch. And there are some great synthetic pheromone products on the market, um, which can either give them a sense of familiarity and security, um, or there's a, a, a new one called um, Feliway Friends, which actually can um, mimic the um, pheromone that the mother produces for her kittens and creates a, a, a sense of, of um, greater bonding between two cats who might have fallen out, for example. So there's lots of um, um, lots of ways we can respect the cat's sense of smell just by doing those those few things. Let's go back to our, our key to success. So we talked about population density in the territory, and I know this is nothing. Uh, you can't do anything about this, um, but unfortunately, if you are living in a very overcrowded area, um, this can have a, a massive impact on your cats. When you look at um, domestic um, cat uh, population densities obviously they vary depending on whether they're rural or urban and you can go from from anything from naught obviously on one end of the scale to as many as 3,000 cats per square kilometer so hugely dense and those densities of cat populations that we have in in our urban environments far exceeds anything that would occur naturally so we know that we're putting our cats under under pressure when we put them into an environment with loads of other cats around so um you might think well that's not going to apply to mine because mine are indoor cats anyway but when you see some of these photos of cats that are encountering other cats outside um we have air bricks we have air coming through gaps in doors they can smell other cats they can see other cats and it does put an awful lot of pressure potentially on cats that are indoors um, so it, it does have an impact and it does give a sense of social overcrowding that then is um, brought back indoors, so to speak, and actually influences the relationship with, uh, with the resident cat. So it's something to think about. As far as what you can do, it's very difficult to avoid moving into a cat with, uh, an area with a high cat population because quite often it's not apparent until you move there. And obviously populations can change. But certainly if you're aware of it being high numbers, then probably it would be wise to limit yourself to a two cat household or, or consider a secure garden. You can see those top pictures. There are some, some examples of the fencing with the inverted bracket system, which is a, a very reliable system to keep not only your cats in, but other cats out. Um, you can see there there's a, uh, a sprinkler system there with a, a, a bunny rabbit rushing away as it's being sprayed with water, which is uh, basically a motion detector uh, water uh, system. But to be honest with you, probably the secure garden um, might be a better outcome for you if you are 
uh, experiencing problems with other cats in your area actually causing distress for your multi-cat household. So what is our conclusion? I've had multi-cat households. I have a single cat household now and I probably won't go back to having a multi-cat household. But when I did have it, it was uh, enormous fun and it was a joy. Uh, it was a joy to have them. And I was very lucky. Um, looking back, it, it wasn't too bad at all. And I hope that you're saying, do you know what? Mine isn't too bad at all either. But as you know, the choice of individuals really matters. And they do need management they do need resource provision you do have to have more cat stuff in your home than people who own just one cat and the external environment uh, can also have a negative impact so you just need to be aware of that there's very little you can do about it apart from as i say to go through the um, uh, option of securing your garden so there we are that's a trip through um, some multi-cat household uh, thoughts and thank you very much for listening i wonder uh, bruce whether anybody has any questions yeah vicky that was absolutely fabulous thank you so much folks i did promise you a fabulous presentation and vicky didn't let us down that really was brilliant and it is so much food for thought it's just absolutely wonderful to start thinking about these multi-cat households and we do have a lot of questions coming through i'm going to toss the first hand grenade at you and go uh, indoor exclusive versus indoor versus and outdoor mixtures yes so uh, depending on what part of the world you live we have some very strong feelings about the only happy cat is an indoor cat uh, or the only happy cat is a cat with uh, freedom to to roam outside it's a massive debate and it's very difficult to fall down on either side um, in an ideal world I'm going to shoot it out there I would say I would like to give my cat freedom of choice. I would like to be able to present it with an environment that is safe for it and it can choose whether it goes out or comes in. However, the world is not an ideal world. and It's not that safe a place uh, in some areas. All I would say to people is if you are, for whatever reason, making the decision to keep your cat indoors exclusively, then you need to work hard to make sure that everything that cat could have had in a free life you can reasonably uh, reproduce or simulate uh, indoors and that's that's quite difficult if people have a garden i really advocate securing gardens now the second part of that question is do you keep uh, is it better to keep a cat exclusively indoors or to give it access outside every now and then um, that's a different topic altogether because if a cat has access outside I would rather it chose when it was safe to go out it's very difficult for us to judge when it's safe for our cats to go outside so um, it would be better to give them freer access outside I think because um, the cat doesn't have a choice yeah. so that's a that's a whole different um, that's a whole different webinar isn't it really yeah, no, it's a very, very difficult subject and it's a very, very hot topic. As a practicing veterinarian myself, I must say that um, when I was practicing in London, we had a very high percentage of indoor only cats. Obviously, you don't want to let them out because it's so busy and everything else. Yeah. Um, but I did find an, an extremely high number of aggressive cats. Yes. Um, because of the, not because they were kept inside, but because they didn't have the environmental enrichment, which yes. they would have had outside. Correct. And I get very frustrated and that frustration can come out in aggressive behavior. And I have to say, as a clinical animal behaviorist, the majority of the cats uh, I see are, are cats who are kept indoors. So yeah. make of that what you will. <laughs> right. Well, we'll get you back on another webinar with that one, shall we? <laughs> okay. uh, we have a, a question here that says, um, if you have one cat who does not like being social, when the others are social and interact, should you rehome that cat to a, a single cat household? When, uh, am I understanding the one cat who isn't social is not social with the other cats or with the owner? I would assume with the other cats. If that's a very good question, and I have to say that's a that's a a really fine gesture to actually contemplate whether that is not the right environment for that one cat. So I applaud this person. This is a very responsible question. 
if that cat is, if there's any sense that cat is distressed in any way from their life, uh, being in the presence of the other cats, if they are causing them some concern, then if they know of somebody who can take on uh, a single cat and would be glad to do so, sometimes it's possible to rehome within the family, then you probably be doing that cat a massive service to give them a home as a singleton and ironically what people report when when they do do these sort of very selfless acts of love is that that one cat who was really struggling uh, living with the others they completely blossom as a single cat so I would say well done to the person for raising that question um, and you know, certainly look within your own circle of friends and family first to see if you can find the perfect home. I mean, that's, if they think they're struggling, I think that's a very good idea. Yeah. And it goes back to what you were saying, that survey you did where people uh, were asked what happened to your existing cat when another one died. And again, in practice, I've seen it so many times where people go, man, I've had these two cats for seven years and the one was this shy, quiet, timid cat and the other one got run over or whatever. And, and now I've got this beautiful, engaged cat. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. And we only, the awfully sad thing is for owners who experience this, they only find out when one of the cats is dead or isn't yeah. there anymore. And it's so sad because they've lost those years, really. Yeah. Vicky, we've got loads of comments coming in of how wonderful that was, how informative it was. Um, Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, It's just the comments go on and on and on. Jose has got an interesting question for you. Jose says, some authors say that cats are amoral. They do whatever they works for them only. Would you agree with that? I I wouldn't label them as immoral because that that suggests that they are are bound by some sort of moral compass like humans are. I I would say that they are self-reliant and they, as such, from a human perspective, they're not empathic. So they will do what suits them um, because they're completely dependent on themselves to survive. Yeah. So, but I don't think we should make a moral judgment on that. It just makes them really effective cats. Um, if they were people, we might have something to say about <laughs> a non-empathic, you know, a psychopath. But yeah. um, certainly, I think they're just beautifully functioning uh, species. I wouldn't make any moral judgments on them. I just like them exactly the way they are. Yeah. I don't want them to change. As you and I were chatting before we came live, um, my favourite saying, dogs survive because of us and cats survive despite us. Yes, and I said to you then, and I repeat it again, I am going to quote you because this is so (laughs) true. We love them, but sometimes we do crazy things and actually cats just go, oh, whatever. Honestly, humans, what are they like? Yeah, that's it. Um, Again, we've got loads and loads of comments coming in. Um, Excuse me if I don't get the pronunciation of this right. Adamir? says thank you that this has been fascinating and has confirmed my feelings that it would be unfair to introduce a third cat to my contented twin cats oh well done you that's i'm so pleased and i think that sounds like a jolly good decision well made well done Uh, really really good um more comments coming in susan says any tips on how to stop conflict once it has been established i think that going back to what we talked about the five pillars Um, There's nothing to stop you from doing that, making sure there's plenty of resources, making sure they're positioned well. Um, I do rather like this new um, uh, Feliway product, Feliway Friends. And uh, it might be worth getting a plug in and go to your local vet and talk to them about it. Um, But certainly if you've got conflicts and you just feel that this is escalating, I'm not liking it, I don't know what's going on. I really strongly recommend you visit your vet and ask your vet for a referral to a suitably qualified uh, behaviourist because um, the sooner you address the problem and the behaviourist gives you key advice to suit your situation, the quicker you can have a resolution. You really don't want this to become chronically unpleasant for your cats. Uh, Vicky, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, as a veterinarian in practice, I'd like to reinforce that um, you want a referable to a suitably qualified um, person. Uh, there's a lot of, of cat nuts out there that claim to be behaviorists and dog nuts too. Um, and, and you want somebody that is 
registered, qualified, and they have an affiliation to a behavioral organization. Don't just take any any kind of random person that happens to pop up on the internet presuming that they can sort out all your problems. I think that's very true. And I think there's some people with very great uh, website creation skills, but please be guided by your vet. Your vet will know the appropriate societies they need to be affiliated with. Uh, Well-meaning advice, if it's not good advice, is dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nicola has, has uh, said, um, thanks very much to Vicky and the Feline Friends Academy team. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of a blurb on the Feline Friends Academy? Give them a punt. Sorry. So I didn't catch that, Bruce. Sorry. But Nicola has said, uh, hi, and thank you to Vicky and the Feline Friends Academy team. Do you want to give us a little punt for the Feline Friends Academy? <sighs> Absolutely wonderful. Do you know, I've done a few webinars for them and I'm really thrilled at the way that they are bringing good information to the pet owning public. I am a great believer that if we love cats, we need to find out about them because the more we know about them, the better we can love them the way they need to be loved. And Feline Friends create a great, uh, a great vehicle for that. So, and thank you so much uh, for feline friends for asking me to to do this webinar yeah there we go really folks it, it comes down to reliable organizations um you know any idiot can post any nonsense on the internet and yeah. as uh, donald trump likes to say fake news um, <laughs> but really you know it is like that uh, so just get a get a reliable website and and um go to the organizations and uh, the vets are in a good position to refer you to organizations um, that are recognized and run by people in the know. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah, definitely. I absolutely agree with you, Bruce. One last question, Vicky. Um, yeah. An anonymous question has come in that says, how to avoid the oldest cat to eat the food of the kitten or opposite way around? Oh, I know. Right. Um, I hope that most of you have your cats microchipped, which are these little tiny implants that go just in the scruff underneath the skin, which, which um, creates this unique identification. Um, if you're really struggling and you can't sort of separate their feeding areas, then you might want to have a look at um, a particular feeding device, which is activated by the microchip in the back of your cat or your kitten's neck. And it's a, a little bowl of food with a lid on, there's a little archway, and only the right microchip, uh, when it goes through the archway, lifts up the lid. So you basically program just the kitten's little head um, to go to the kitten food, um, if that's the only way around the problem is that the older cat eats the kitten food. Um, there are sort of different ways of, of doing it, you know, separating the cats when they're eating and everything. But if that can't be done, then the easiest thing is to get these, these personal feeders that basically only pop up when the right cat sticks their head in. Yeah, one thing I don't know you can you can comment on that I've always felt is avoid line of sight while they're eating. Definitely, and this is what I was saying about feeding places. Um, cats should they they would prefer to eat alone, but if for years you've had your cats eating together, to suddenly separate their their bowls can be quite distressing for them. Even though uh, it puts them under pressure to eat together, so. Um, I would definitely put feeding bowls out of sight always. But if you've previously fed the other way, put bowls elsewhere, but keep those two bowls together. And then your cats will decide uh, whether they want to eat out of eye line from each other. It's, it's all about giving the cat choice. We have in our head what we think a cat would prefer, um, but giving them the options. But definitely out of sight of each other. I'm, I, I'm absolutely with you there. Yeah. Again, it comes down to cats survive despite us. We have to give them the options to choose. Exactly. Exactly. Vicky, this has been an absolutely fascinating time. The comments and everything are coming pouring in about how people have enjoyed it and how they've learned. So it's my, my great pleasure to be able to thank you on behalf of the audience for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. It's been a pleasure, Bruce. And thank you to everyone and goodbye to everyone. Thanks, everybody. That's it for tonight. Uh, to Simon, my, uh, to Paul, my controller in the background, thank you for all your help tonight in making things run seamlessly. And from my side, it's good night until the next webinar.